Hey, data lovers. It's Jeff here from iDeck. It's November of 2020, and many of us are getting ready for the holiday weekend right about now. We're also getting ready to transition our children who are making accelerated progress back to the classroom. So, I thought this might be a good time to replay an episode from last January with teacher leaders Amy Smith and Leslie McBain. In this episode, they talk about the topic of preparing our children to return to the classroom, and Amy shares with us a discontinuation guide that she adapted from Clay's Literacy Lessons Designed for Individuals. So, enjoy this ILDF replay, and we will talk data to you later. All right there. Hey, data lovers, and welcome to another episode of I Love Data Fridays here at the International Data Evaluation Center on the campuses of the Ohio State University. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new episode, episode 43 of I Love Data Fridays, and to a new installment of How Do You Do Data? And as you can see on the screen today, I'm going to be joined by two teacher leaders. So let's get right to it. Hey, who's talking data to you? Well, of course, you've got me, Jeff Breimer Bashore, director and co principal investigator here at the International Data Evaluation Center. And I will be joined by Amy Smith, teacher leader from Madison County Schools in Kentucky, and also by Leslie McBain, teacher leader from Southwestern City Schools right here in Ohio. So today we will be talking to Amy and Leslie about the challenge of preparing students to transition out of reading recovery and back into the classroom. And specifically, uh, we will be focusing on a discontinuation planning guide developed by Amy, which she adapted uh, from literacy lessons designed for individuals. And this was something that uh, her teachers asked if she could help do. Um, so Leslie and Amy will be talking about this discontinuation planning guide. Um, and then Leslie and Amy are going to spend a lot of time um, about talking about empowering teachers to make the most responsive decisions for students throughout a child's program, including opportunities reading recovery teachers have to work with their students outside of reading recovery lessons to facilitate this transition. All right, let's get to it and let's talk a little data. I love data Friday. 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 Leslie, Amy, why don't you both go ahead and start with introducing yourselves, where you work, how long you've been in education and reading recovery. Okay, um, I'm Leslie McBain. I work in the Southwestern City Schools just outside of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I've been a reading recovery teacher since 96 and a teacher leader since 2001. And um, I'm in a very diverse district in that it has a little bit of everything, urban, rural, suburban, EL. It's the fifth largest district in Ohio, and um, I've been here since 2010. All right. I'm Amy Smith, and I'm a teacher leader in Richmond, Kentucky, Madison County, Kentucky, just south of Lexington. And I trained in 2001 as well. Leslie, I didn't know that we trained the same year as a teacher leader, and I was not a reading recovery teacher before. So that was a lot of fun doing that all at once. Um, <laughs> but I've been here since that time, and my district, I think we're the seventh largest in Kentucky, which is around 10,000 kids. Um, we have um, sort of, you know, sort of suburbanish area of Lexington, uh, but I also have, I serve districts that are in Eastern Kentucky, including two very small independent districts and a school on top of a mountain district type thing. So I, even though it's not nearly as diverse as, as um, Columbus, it we have challenges that differ from place to place. All right, and uh, probably the most important question of the day, and that this is a joke, actually. Uh, uh, you know, what movies and uh, shows are we watching on the Hulus and the Netflixes and all that stuff? Well, I'm a big fan of The Crown. I just think it's exquisitely done, and I'm trying to, like, not binge on it because I love it so much. So I'm try trying to go slow, but I'm loving that. And, of course, 
Uh, what else I'm watching right now is to see how our Steelers are doing, right, Amy? That's like an important part of <laughs> things right now, right? It is. And um, I know a lot of people um, think of this as the happiest time of the year because of the holidays. Um, here in Kentucky, and as a Steeler fan, it's actually the happiest time of the year because we have all at once college basketball, college football, and the NFL. Um, so honestly, sports take up a lot of my watching time, but unlike Leslie's sort of intellectual TV time, yes. um, <laughs> mine is a little more, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, but um, I am right now, I've loved Riverdale that, mm. you know, came out, I've, I sort of love that. And um, I love that sort of dark, um, reinterpretation of old stories and so right now I'm completely obsessed with the new, the, the new CW Nancy Drew series oh you and Beth was it Beth that's watching no Is someone she watching it too? probably no someone else I can't remember who anyway well, I'll, I'll... I, you know she, Nancy Drew is the hero that that we all deserve mm -hmm. and I was obsessed with her as a child I loved her and this is really so cool because if you read those books they mm -hmm. really um flesh out the characters who are her best friends, George and Bess in a really cool way. So I'm, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So today we're going to have a conversation and I have it up on the screen here. We're going to be talking about our um, a conversation that centers around preparing students to transition successfully um, back to the classroom. So um, I kind of wonder if you guys can start the story of like, you know, what were the problems that you were seeing and, you know, how we've started um, using the discontinuation planning guide? Well, if I, here's what I want to start with. And that is, I think that discontinuing in general is a topic that can be fraught with emotion and intensity and, um, you know, difficult conversations around it. Um, and so I want to lead with this. We do and have always, according to Dr. Clay, believed in the idea of two positive outcomes, um, which I would actually argue there's probably more than just two. Um, so whatever, however this discussion goes, keeping in mind that I know Leslie and I both firmly um, believe in that idea that whether or not the, the child, his status category at the end is discontinued, there is no negative outcome for a reading recovery child ever. Um, at the same time, the reality is, and I think you had Jeff on the last one um, or two before this, maybe talking about advocacy. Uh -huh. The reality is that when you're in the field, you're forward facing um, advocacy efforts and what people look at is this, how did you do according to this? Did you discontinue, you know, success? And um, they see success through the lens of, uh, you know, reaching expectations and not needing further intervention. That's just how the world we live in. Um, and so as a teacher leader, I'm very focused on that as far as making sure we're doing as well as we can and getting as many kids out as possible. Um, the problem that we had in our side a few years ago, the data actually that led us on this sort of discovery was, we actually had a pretty decent discontinuation rate, but we began to see a gap between exit and end of the year text levels and random sample, which I know that's again fraught with all kinds of technicalities, but we began to worry that um, something that we weren't doing enough to prepare children to fully integrate into the classroom and do well without support on the back end. Um, Leslie? I would agree. And I think too, um, it's very easy, I think, in the uh, tyranny of the urgent as, as weeks go on for a child series of lessons that, that teachers use testing at the end of a child series of lessons as the determining factor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think they do that intentionally, but without some real intentionality around that preparation, it kind of reminds me on the other side of it is in the section 
of when acceleration is compromised, there are many steps involved in getting that child back on track. And I'm wondering if on both ends, we don't do due diligence to either prepare or alert ourselves when um, before just that final decision making, that shouldn't be the decision making, it should be the evidence of the decision made. And I think that goes along with that beforehand preparation. And that that's easy to get lost in the weeds in that, I think. In the well, and I'm thinking, Lee, it's, it derives from the fact that the discontinuation, that term, is a lot of different things. It is a status category. It is a label to put on a child's accomplishments and a teacher's percentages of accomplishment. Um, but I think what you just said about an end point, a lot of our teachers were viewing it as the thing you did at the end mm -hmm. instead of sort of a process you're working through and toward from the very beginning, but most especially when you start to see evidence of, of real acceleration and a working system, then it's a it's a very specific process. And she says in the last four weeks, Dr. Play says, you know, about four weeks out, that was the thing that our, our teachers were not doing almost at all. Agreed. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that four weeks out sort of catches them by surprise unless they're thinking about that from the outset of the child series of lessons. And it's hard, you know, as a teacher leader, it's it's hilarious. Um, I thought I'd done a great job a couple of years ago when we got the new book because I, we started the whole year with begin with the end in mind. And we read the chapter together and we went through and we talked about school teams. I think that was 2017. That was how we started the year. And yet in the day-to-day -day chaos and the real life, by the time they got there, which is about this time for a lot of them, all of that, you know, well-intentioned, thinking in August was sort of subsumed within the chaos of life in the school. Um, and I saw this um, when Beth Moxie, a teacher leader, my teacher leader partner in Lexington and Amy Emmons created online monitoring, not mantra, I hate that word, but our records are online so that we have a way to sort of support teachers along the way and look for patterns of acceleration. Um, and so I started dropping comments in when I would see just amazing gains and you could tell children were accelerating quickly and they were moving into those, um, the cusp of text level 12, 14. So I started dropping comments like, well, so are you doing some things like, you know, in, that she describes to prepare this child? Like for example, go into the classroom and observe. And one of my very honest teachers came to me with her book in her hand and said, I forget all of the different ideas, all the different suggestions mm -hmm. um, that are in here. So as a teacher leader, I thought, well, we know how to keep it easy to learn for children, but we are also responsible for doing that for adults. So it led us to explore more deeply together. What are some ways to make all of that guidance within um, that chapter, the chapter on discontinue, more visible? Mm -hmm. And so that's how we came up with the discontinuation planning guide. All right. Now that we have uh, the backstory to the discontinuation guide, can you give us a description of what we are seeing on the screen here? Okay, so Leslie and I are both going to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, processes we've used to help our teachers help their children make a smoother transition out of intervention into the classroom. And again, one of the things that we did here was to redisplay the massive amount of content from chapter seven in literacy lessons in a way that sort of demystified that process or made it easier to do in the chaos of a teacher's life. So we did not um, change any of the language or add any of our own. We just took that information and page one of the guide basically gives teachers when to initiate the process, like the time frame, which was really, really important. You see that in the left column. Yep. Uh, it was really important because one of the things Leslie and I both talked about was they were just waiting way too long or seeing it as an endpoint instead of sort of an ongoing process that really gets intentional uh, around, as Dr. Clay says, about four weeks before the end. Um, and so we took that second column then sort of is the what 
the why. I, it says what, but it's more about the it, what and why. So it's here's what you're thinking about in terms of understanding this child. Here's what you're doing um, in terms of responding to those understandings and so on. Again, direct quotes from Clay. Over in that last column, we took, she actually, Dr. Clay has almost all of this information in there in some way. And we just restated some of that, some directly and some in the form of a question to give them some actions, some real actions. Because the second part, those are actions, but they're more about thinking. Um, and so this became very important um, because maybe they were doing one or two of these things, but seeing it all there and how many opportunities or options they had um, became really important. For instance, down um, in the um, third row down, you'll see it leads with conduct more observations, conduct additional assessment, um, compare those two. Those sort of the need for us to find ways to make that doable for teachers actually led us to sort of a standard process we do now in which that our teachers engage in an unassisted reading, writing text, reading and writing activity with their children every single month of the program as a way to step back, not just in the last four weeks, but throughout and really um, reevaluate what that child is doing independently. So it became very important. However, that last one, compare observations and assessment data um, to your thinking about self-extension, that also led us to the need to have a point of comparison because a lot of our teachers have been doing intervention for a very long time. They have not been engaged with, with children who are not finding literacy acquisition difficult in a very long time. So within that box and sort of like working around those ideas that have always been in our book and we've read them, it gave us a new need as teachers, a new way to um, help our kids transition, which was, hey, maybe every now and then we need to read with a child who's not finding this difficult. Um, and so in our district, for example, we employed this process with our teachers that they would also pull a child as a comparison that was not finding that hard and do the same unassisted reading and writing task for them and with them. And that became our not only our comparison of how our children did in both settings, but a way to sort of also shift, recalibrate your understanding of what that expectation was. Um, so the, the form on the front is just um, that, and it, it's led to a lot of um, other opportunities for learning um, and actually adapting our OPD. The second page, this was this, now anything that a teacher asks for, I try to do because we often view things from our own world as teacher leaders, but when they ask for something specific, it means something to me. Um, and even if I don't do it exactly the way they want, I always try to respond to them. And one of the needs that my teacher, Michelle, um, said was, I don't know where to write this down. Like if I do these observations, where do I write that down and how do I know? And I said, well, could we just create some kind of grid, and this is not required for our teachers, that needs to be, but almost all of them use it. So we just created a grid re-stating um, what, what those possible action steps were, as you can see there, and we broke it down so it would be, it would, it would remind them about this happens over a period of weeks, and it also gives them a place to sort of reflect on and keep track of what they did, like Leslie mentioned earlier about um, you know, if a child is, if their program is 18 weeks long, this should have started well before, like week 13-ish. And so um, this gives them a way, page two, of remembering what they did and also sort of keeping track of what might be a, a, a next step. And there's one row for each each week in there, and they pretty much have the same options of things to do that they can choose from each week. Yes, and again, this is a teacher. Um, this was a teacher recommendation because she said, "Can you list those out so we can circle or highlight or underline?" Because even yeah. the act of writing them out again is another three minutes of their life. Yeah, day. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's why we did that. And notice that the very last one says "other." Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have aimed at not 
limiting their thinking around what else is possible because we do that for ourselves all the time. So other is, hey, if you have another idea, write it down here. We'll add it to the list. So in a sense, you're you're uh, trying to give your teachers uh, permission to to adapt the lessons as as needed. Not not only that, but a um, expectation that you are making instructional adaptations to that child's reading recovery lessons that map onto the areas that need to be more supported in order to make that transition out. Leslie and I talked about this last week. I think there were two elements to this. One is reading recovery teachers are so conscientious and they are so married to the idea of compliance and making sure everything is there. So there's an element of making big adaptations that's a little daunting, you know, because you're like, in addition to everything else I do every day. So we had to sort of reinterpret what an adaptation was and then also give them permission to do all these things that Clay describes. For instance, she describes over and over the idea of observation and additional assessment in one way or the other. Well, you only have 30 minutes. And so you have to figure out when and how. So I had to kind of say, these things are part of the child's process, not other than outside their reading recovery lessons. And so I sort of had to give them permission and an expectation that this time they have with the child, their 30 minutes needs to also and can include all of these things that Dr. Clay is suggesting, not on top of, because quite frankly, there is no on top of time anymore. Um, the second thing is we had to just, we had to talk together about there. It's one thing to say adapt lessons, but that's a big nebulous How? world. How and for what purposes, right? Go ahead, Les. Well, I just was saying it just in a PD last week, uh, continuing for teachers, we actually had to create a list mm -hmm. of like a menu of possibilities and not exhaustive and not um so we just went through each lesson component and thought about what it might look like and and the rationale behind adaptation so you know if you just quickly go through the how necessary in that 30 minute time is familiar reading when you're trying to help kids access more complex text mm -hmm. and do problem solving on the run. So um, it's not that familiar reading isn't important, but if you've got evidence, for instance, that it sounds good, looks good, all those things, is there another place in their day that the children can uh, have some designated familiar reading time within the classroom? You know, that sort of thing. How necessary, dare I say it, is the running record each and every day when when the payoff seems to be as kids move up into a higher level text in the first read. So um, uh, if, if the reading is going well and they're problem solving on the run, able to do some more complex processing, what does their writing look like in comparison to the classroom? So uh, would there be lessons in which reading was given shorter amount of time, if at all, so that you could make their make teaching decisions, I think, that that supported their writing and make their writing look more like the classroom and think about the kinds of I mean, we do this time of year, kids are doing books that teach, you know, and, and doing all of these kinds of, of things. What do our kids work in the classroom look like on those sorts of things? So we actually had to go through because a naming it gave some permission to it. And be it help them think about the rationale why the adaptation, not adaptation for its own sake, but but the the rationale behind it. And I think the other piece of it is that 30 minutes, they don't have any other time in their day. That also includes the classroom observation and coordination piece. So they're not going to take extra time. Um, that is their lesson time when they're observing that child in a reader's or writer's workshop or guided, whatever the classroom instruction looks like. So I found that taking your um, idea and Clay's as well of adaptation had to had to sort of have some legs on it so that they could they could know what what that might look like. Our teachers felt reasonably comfortable with running record as maybe not a necessary tool daily when you're working towards like in, in complex text when they need more time to engage with that. 
particularly some of our kids need more opportunities to not only construct meaning from their own meaning from complex text, but also in word solving, you know, solving different kinds of words. And you need opportunities, not only with books that are new, but we found that there was no time, almost no time after the first read very often to engage in some more sort of extended word study or whatever that a lot of our kids need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and what you said about writing is interesting because one of the things that I think we have done as a result of this work around discontinuation that has been so beneficial, they were really pretty um, aware of what the expectations were in reading in the classroom because they, you know, they work alongside them, but they were not aware of writing. Like, what are kids expected to be able to write now? What kinds of stories and like transitions and episodic texts? And that's just the expectation now. And because they were removed from that setting and never had an opportunity to engage in watching Writers Workshop, for example, they knew that they had to get children writing more complex texts, but they didn't quite know exactly what that looked like in terms of classroom expectations. We finally just had to acknowledge what you said about time because all of our teachers have the same planning time as first grade, almost every single one. So when our teachers are free, there's nothing happening in the classroom there. I, th I think this is an important point though, because I was quite surprised. I'm not the kind of teacher leader that like does drive-bys and audits records because I have a very trusting relationship with a great group of teachers like I just don't do those sorts of things I, I sort of trust them and at the very same time when we started talking about making adaptations one of their very first worries was what will I put on my lesson record in that spot you know yeah they do that's conscientiousness so we have to say explicitly I don't care write down you know so the second part the second page of that discontinuation form was sort of the here's where you put your stuff if you feel the need to confess your soul then on this date i was doing this um but i think there's something really necessary about this within this process because I, we want our trainers we want to feel like we're doing the things that our trainers expect and they the same is true with us mm -hmm. um so i think there's an element of just make it very explicit and clear that this is important and expected and you're not worried about there not being a running record that day or a cut up sentence or whatever Jeff, you ask a question about transitions and Leslie has started talking about making adaptations as a way to foster smooth transitions. So I think it would be really useful if we sort of got into that a little bit more and explored that ways we have done that because Leslie and I have done something in common around that. And I'm gonna let her go first because this is what it's like to have an amazing collegial network. It's when they take something you do and then use it in a way that you didn't expect and it makes it even better. So after, I mean, I just sort of saw this guide as a way to demystify the process, make it linear and give teachers a way to record stuff. I sent it to Leslie to review and immediately the next week she comes back with, hey, here's how I used it for behind the mirror, which was brilliant. And I think it gets at this idea of how we prepare teachers for the transition. So Leslie, you wanna speak about that just a little? So when um, Amy gave me a chance to look at this document, I was really excited because I had had a plan for an ongoing professional development, which circled around discontinuing decisions and what kinds of things kids should be able to do and should know. So the way we used this was to really unpack that first side of this document in terms of before, like if you're thinking about a lesson behind the glass, looking at a child's records and thinking about in conversation with the teacher and through artifacts, like what's this child look like? Is he ready? Is he not? And um, the child that was coming to the behind the glass session, it was a general consensus that they were, they were on the road to being discontinued. And the other thing that we did is from that same, that child's same classroom, we arranged for a 
average progress, not the top of the class, but an average progress student to come as well. And um, kind of looked at both of these children through the lens of this document, both before observing them behind the glass and then after um, to see the evidence of, of what we just saw in the lesson. And it really gave our teachers a chance to Amy's point of seeing what what average progress looks like in a specific setting because Clay's pretty clear about the fact that there's a range of expectations depending on the setting of a child. So it really helped our intervention teachers who that's their world get a feel for and be reminded of what average progress looks like. And so that was that was very helpful but just being able to use some of these questions, these guiding questions or discussion points against that backdrop of a very shared experience of looking at an average child and then comparing them. And interestingly enough, in our setting, the reading, the child, they were close in levels. Uh, the, the average progress child was much quicker at, at solving on the run. And, and that was very apparent. But but surprisingly, the reading recovery students' writing was superior to the classroom in that, in that particular point. So that, you know, that both of those created lots of opportunity for discussion and then for re-examining each teacher's own set of records for a child who they felt was making accelerated progress. So it really provided a lot of good discussion. And then this year, again, like I had mentioned, we, we really look closely at what ad adaptations might look like um, towards the end of the kids' lesson series. Well, and Leslie said to me on a call a couple of weeks ago, hey, have you ever discontinued a child behind the mirror? And I said, oh my gosh, of course I have in training, but here I am with this focus on discontinuation enough to create a form. And yet, I hadn't really done that in ongoing PD. It was ridiculous. It's sometimes, you know, thank goodness for brilliant colleagues. But so last week, in fact, um, actually this week, in fact, was it Tuesday, Leslie? I sent you some stuff. Um, I think we did something similar. We had a teacher, uh, Michelle, again, one of my teachers at my school, and um, who has a child who was in this, certainly on this, you know, waning edge of their program. And um, we really wanted the group to work together to construct some ideas around adaptations. And so what happened was the child was sick and did not show up for the behind the mirror. However, because we had those unassisted reading and writing samples and also the comparison child, we just, we still framed the discussion in these terms, but we dug deeply for an hour and a half into really understanding the, the processing and the problem solving and reading and writing. And we charted the two children's strengths and needs side by side. And like you, we saw much more, the actions, the problem solving actions weren't so different qualitatively, but the speed at which they occurred, the independence, very different. Even, I mean, that was from um, the reports of, of the teacher who had read with both of them. But what was so cool was the big difference between these two children was in writing for us a lot you know primarily around complexity not just around like hearing your recording sounds of words and you know the way that they um approximated um spelling patterns those sorts of things wasn't so different but the construction of the structure and the complexity of the message was vastly different we had the most illuminating conversation, number one, about classroom expectations for first grade writers and really deep, detailed discussion about possibilities for giving this child opportunity to engage with and construct some more complex messages for different purposes and audiences. So those are the kinds of questions, Jeff, I know where you, you know, don't engage with us in the field um, in the same way, we don't get to have those discussions much um, and they're becoming more and more important as I was just rereading Jeff's article, Bringing Your A-Game. Let me just interrupt Amy here for one second, just because there's a lot of Jeff's here in this interview. Uh, so what Amy, Amy's referring to the article that was written by Jeff Williams, uh, Bringing Our A-Game, Acceleration and Getting to Higher Levels of Text. 
All right, back to our interview. Which sort of, you know, mm-hmm. as a grounding force in my life. And um, we are ignoring sometimes we have our perspective and the teacher perspective, like the child's perspective we work with and the teacher's perspective as a reading recovery teacher and how that works together. But that school and classroom expectation perspective in the end is the one against which we're judged. I would so agree with that. And it's interesting because before we did that PD that I just mentioned, uh, the reading, you know, in preparation that was assigned was Jeff's article. So yeah, on bringing your A game, so helpful to think about it. And I, I think, I think that comparison and that alignment really supports the classroom teacher expertise piece that I think sometimes is a missing voice mm-hmm. in the reading recovery teacher's ear. All the more reason for them to be, for our teachers to be able to go in and see the instruction and how our student is making use of that, assimilating it into their learning. It really strengthens, I think, the collegiality of the classroom teacher and the reader recovery teacher. And they have a lot to teach our teachers about classroom expectations, pace of learning, and general expectations. For sure. And I think another thing that's interesting is sometimes when we have these big ideas, it feels like another burden on a teacher, like, oh, they're going to ask me to do this other new thing now, great. But there is something over time, like, for instance, the unassisted reading writing task and reading with a comparison child and then thinking about discontinuation and tracking that, doing the extra observation, all of that seemed like an extra, an add-on to them, when in fact, what they have learned over time that all of those really important processes that Dr. Clay talks about enable their work in a way that makes it quicker and more effective and more efficient. So it's really interesting where what started as a, oh, great, this is another thing. Now we're seeing the wisdom that's actually within the words in this chapter seven, which is this is not an extra for you. It is a way to make your work actually kind of easier, more targeted, more responsive, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Jeff, um, but, you know, what in, what prompted this as an idea for I Love Data Friday was you asked Leslie now the question, what have you done um, around discontinuation either, you know, with teachers, what kind of work have you done, which we've answered. Maybe the one that we haven't is what have been the profound effects of this and what challenges have they helped us overcome? Yeah. So I will start with from a from a child perspective and then um, let Leslie add on, most significantly and linking back to our original data, we don't have children who are labeled as many children, I should say, it's not like it'll never happen, but we, because our teachers are more grounded in the world of what a smoothly operating system looks and sounds like in real time, and they are thinking more purposefully about switching things up and making adaptations that respond directly toward that. I think as far as reading is concerned, we don't have nearly as many of those close enough kids that we sort of dragged across the finish line and their status category was discontinued, but then they show up at the beginning of second grade and there's like significant fallback and that's sort of devastating. So I won't say that like this guide didn't solve this problem, but I think engaging an inquiry around discontinuation as a process and are we doing everything we're supposed to has really helped us in my site address that difficulty in particular. And I think for us, like one of the the challenges that that has emerged out of this work is perhaps creating a baseline for what constitutes real progress and the decision making around discontinuing. And by that, I mean, there may be students for some, in some cases that maybe in the past we would have felt not okay with, but sort of resigned to dragging them across the finish line. Whereas now we're saying no, no, if they're not ready, they're not ready. And, and just being clear eyed about that and because we have more evidence around a decision that more time needs to be needed, needed, which is 
you know, she prepares for in that chapter seven as well. So I think in a way that is a positive outcome that doesn't necessarily initially transfer to better percentages, but I think over time gets you on the road to making better decisions and having more success in the future. I, I see it in our setting sometimes as a work in progress. Like it, what it, what it did for us is it illuminated the challenges in a way that I think before they were not necessarily clear to us. Well, and it's, it's interesting. You know, one of the things that is only now I'm seeing is we we throw around terms all the time that we think we all have shared meaning, you know, that has the common meaning for. And one of those uh, frustrating terms for me is level of support because it is a thing. But what I found is that this these conversations and engaging in this type of assessment and observation and shared discussion has moved our teachers beyond calling everything level of support, which let me translate that means either really high or not at all. Like, I don't know, there's like, it seems like there's no middle there. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason there wasn't clarity on the middle sometimes was we hadn't unpacked level to mean explicit examples of what that could be. So in, they're not just thinking of level, they're really thinking more with a great, much greater clarity about type of support, not just high or low. Yeah. And I, it makes me think, I don't know why, but it, I, in my, I tend to think in analogies and, and what I'm thinking about too, this is, is sort of, we have the beginning, we have the end, the middle is the, the murky part, right? And it is kind of the way children approach word solving. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's easy to determine the beginning and the end, right, of a word, but the middle is where the real work happens. And I think, I think to me, listening to you, that's, that's what it made me think of. Well, you know, I love an analogy. And if you could throw a cat meme in <laughs> to show me what that, I love a cat metaphor for anything. So, um, sorry, Jen. Well <laughs> um, do you want me to, do you want me to send you one you can share on the screen? I have a great one for too easy. What, right, Leslie? For Yes, I think it's necessary. Yeah, no, I'll send it later and you can put it in in the post. Please do, yes. <laughs> um, I think one more thing I want to mention, um, and Leslie and I have talked about this a lot, is we, we often, um, out of necessity in this real life, operate within silos, even within schools. And the one shift that digging into this and getting our classroom teachers more connected, observing in classrooms, not just having drive-by conversations in the hall, um, is the element of team. Um, I don't know how we missed this, that Dr. Clay sort of leads with that about the school teams. If, if yeah. you know, she leads with it and yet we just skip on past to the action steps. So I think for our teachers, they are much more connected in a substantive way, in a mutually supportive way, which you mentioned, Leslie, which is so important, not me as the more knowledgeable other telling you what to do or dictating anything, but mutually supportive. What can we, what do we need to learn from one another? Nothing to add to that, but I, I agree. And I also think that that with the team approach is the shared responsibility. So, um, and I think that's important too, because I do think sometimes reading recovery teachers, because they are siloed and maybe working with struggling readers all day long, feel that it all rests on them and they fail to see the supports that the classroom teacher and the setting just the setting of being in that room, whether it's the word wall or, you know, whatever resources might be available to kids. I feel like they, they forget about those things sometimes in the heat of the moment and, and don't think about how supportive the classroom setting can be for their student. Well, and I've heard Mary Freed say time and time again, it's like, sometimes you're a, it's not the task the child can't do in the classroom. They don't understand the process because it looks different than how we say it or how we present it. For example, writing on lined paper or writing, you know, this little tiny thing. Um, and she's like, you just have to be the translator sometimes. And you just have to show them, hey, this is the same task. You have to do it here just the same way. And I think one of the things that she says in here that sort of missed is you may work alongside the child in their classroom during their lessons in the life. Wow, that was profoundly like, what does she mean?
But I think about some of the examples Mary has given in conference sessions, and it's like, yes, by working alongside them in that context, you allow yourself to perhaps be a translator around, you know how to do this kind of work, but in this, the way they're asking you, the questions they're asking, it means the same thing as this. And so I think that that's another thing that, you know, again, part of that mutual mm -hmm. understanding and support. So Jeff, we made it through an entire webcast without naming a text level. So that's a win. <laughs> and I, it, we, almost, we almost did, but. Amy, Leslie, I wanna say thank you for, for joining uh, I Love Data Fridays today. I felt like I was mostly the silent conversation partner, but you know, one of the things that I'm seeing here is that it, it's, the, it's the ongoing dialogue between you two that has been like the most, one of the most helpful things through this this whole process and everything. So it was probably good I was silent. <laughs> well, let me say this though, you, you're raising something important. Jeff, I'm so grateful that you're giving teacher leaders and trainers and perhaps teachers at some point a platform to hear one another and be connected because we are also very siloed. And I know Leslie and I, through our work in other settings have gotten to be, to know one another. And now I rely on her from three and a half hours away for her advice and her fresh ideas, that's crucial. And it's something that's missing a lot in our broader network, I think. So true. And I just, I couldn't do it without teacher leader colleagues. And so thank you for that platform. And I also think some folks have the same idea, but you try to create it yourself or, you know, you have a glimmer of an idea and then a colleague comes along and flushes it out. And it's just, it's beautiful when it happens. It doesn't always, we don't always have the opportunity to do that. All right, there you go. Our interview with Amy and Leslie about their discontinuation planning guide and transitioning students out of uh, reading recovery. I want to say thank you for watching another episode. And if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just head over and click on the subscribe button right there. And so you can receive all future notifications about I Love Data Fridays. And I'm going to cue some outro music here. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, thank you for watching another episode of I Love Data Fridays. I was so happy that you can join us. And hey, we will talk data to you later.